Sing one, Mr. Becker. Well, sure. You know, okay. Bob is sitting over here, and he brought us a song a couple oh, of years okay. ago. I'll just huh, hold it. Yep. Yeah. And uh, this fella's name here is Bob Bray, and he brought us a song called "Get Up Mule," <laughs> and that's the truth. <laughs>
when I get to heaven, that's when I hear my daddy say, get up. Preacher dressed in faded overalls. Get up, you. a song about mamas. Everybody's either had a mama like this or they know a mama like this. And the, this song really kind of starts out really sad and by by the end of it it's slipped way way over into pitiful. <laughs> oh yeah. Going down. Okay. I also get to sing about things that I never dreamed I'd get to sing about in a song. But you'll see along about the second verse.
How many of y'all have nailed a catfish to a tree before? You done that? It's surprising how many people haven't done that. And that's the best way to clean them. You put a nail right through the head, nail them to a tree, and you cut them around and take them in and cook them. It's the quickest way. And then you leave the tree, you leave the heads on the trees. Haven't you ever been driving through the country and seen a bunch of catfish? Head? Well, there's, that's a dual purpose, is to show off how many you caught to start with. And then also, if you decide to eat outside, you know, when it gets hot in the house and stuff, decide to eat outside, those catfish heads work real good to keep the flies off the watermelon. <laughs> Oh, this? Never yeah, this is a those. cheese grater, cabbage shredder. <laughs> no, it uh, it is a hammered dulcimer, which is the ancestor to the piano. It goes back <coughs> to around 300 BC, or Sears, if I don't make the next payment. And it's got to this country mo mostly through the German and the Irish immigrants. But uh, right now we're going to do uh, a pretty waltz that comes from... Uh, a fella in upstate New York, and actually a few years ago on uh, PBS they had a, a show that was a mini-series called The Civil War, and uh, they used this piece of music as the theme from one episode to the next, and everybody thinks it's a real old song, but it was actually just written about 15 or so years ago. Is one called a Shok and Farewell, and this one was uh, written by a fellow by the name of Jay Unger. Right, that's Felix's boy. <laughs> Felix? Yeah, Felix Unger, that was his boy, Jay Unger. No, no, no. Sure was. No, actually, Felix Unger was just a character. He wasn't a real person. He wasn't real? No. It was a show. Well, who was Oscar talking to all these years? <laughs> well, his parents were an odd couple. How's that? <laughs> oh, that joke is very well. Here we go. <laughs>
Here comes Mama. Ah! Oh, that's a good one. Too much caffeine for this right here. Yeah. Decaf, babe, decaf. Oh, you just First. woke me up, my dear. Well, they sure aren't there. You're, oh, you're making my children's itch, honey. I'll tell you what, there. Woo! Hey, y'all doing that? Ah. Right? Yeah, don't do that to me, there. All right, well, I'm on a mission. I'll talk to you later, honey. Okay. You sweet thing, you big old hunk of meat, you. Woo! 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 Ozark's version of Cher. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Sonny. <laughs> it ain't you, babe. Yeah. <laughs> okay, he wants to hear Orange Blossom special, so we better do it for him. Okay. Throw a little tizzy fit. <laughs> throw a little tizzy fit if we don't play. <laughs> Oh, 
that they fought and nearly died for. Disgrace, burn our flag of liberty. Oh, I'm proud of the flag of America, standing tall for the whole world to see. Her glory shines out above all others. All the ones who are proud. I will pledge my allegiance and honor, and I pray God don't ever let her fall. Cause if our leaders don't bend and pray together, then destruction could come upon us all. stuff down to the picker's shed down here. It's right the, behind the basket shop. And we're going to be down there at 2.30 if y'all want to come down there and join us. And then again at 4 o'clock. And 4 o'clock's the jam session. That's where we invite whoever wants to get up and pick and sing with us. We'll loan you an instrument or whatever. And uh, that's where we prove we're not as stupid as we look because we get y'all to do our work for us. <laughs> Thank y'all for coming around. we got a bunch of CDs and tapes up here. Come on up and get some. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, no, nah. no. Nah. Uh -uh. Now, Jack will tell you, when I'm gone, when we go to seven-day operation, that's me. And he tells totally different kinds of things. He tells Uncle Ferd stories and hunting and fishing lies. But, you know, I didn't understand the thing about, about fox hunters. Yeah. And Jack's an old fox hunter. Over there in, in uh, uh, over around the Eminence, Missouri, over there in Shannon County. That's where Jack's from. And you know, one day he got to telling me and mocking the dogs. He said, Yeah, now, now my uncle, he had this dog named Old Bell, and he really did sound like, Boo! You know, he started mocking these dogs. And I'm like, Good Lord, he does that good. And I understood a lot more than I ever understood about fox hunting. Hey, girls. Hey. They're, uh, uh, no. God, I hate this. I'm going to run these people off. If you're sitting down to get a really good seat to watch homestead pickers, you're in the wrong place. They're going to be down behind the basket shop. You're here to hear a story. Okay, good. That's what I wanted to know. All righty. There was, I'm going to take this thing off. I got too much stuff in here right now. Let's irritating me. There was... No, I can't tell that. <laughs> for, ye for quite a number of years now, people have been aggravating me about making a new record. And I keep saying, yeah, 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 yeah. But I don't know what I'm going to put on it. Most of my really good stuff has already been recorded once. I may be going back into the studio here in a few weeks and we're going to record the greatest hits. I may do that. But uh, 
I was going along and all of a sudden, the thing of it is, you got to have a fair sized pile of money before you can go into the studio or even thought, think about making a new recording. Plus the fact, you know, it's all got to be there at the same time. So that all these things have come together. Well, I was, I, I, I was kind of fighting people off because I didn't have the money and all of a sudden, as the world turns, came here. Last summer. Do you know about that? Well, somebody in Branson had sold the As the World Turns people the idea of bringing their folks in and recording at Andy Williams Theater and having Andy Williams do a couple of lines. Woo! Well, when our people here found out about it, they went and pitched people coming here and doing things like, you know, riding a roller coaster and going into the chapel and all that kind of stuff. And uh, and so they, they was going to come. Now, when you go to work for Silver Dollar City, you sign a piece of paper that signs your rights to your image away. Which means that over the 30 years that I've been here now, I made a 90-minute Christmas special with Pat Boone and Lee Greenwood. And I got paid my hourly wage. I did a ton of work for the Americana Network when they were here, telling stories for them to use as spacers, and I got paid my hourly wage. Except for the day when the park was closed, and my husband and I came in at the Americana Network people's request and shot two 30-minute specials in that kitchen. And then I got paid zip. We were just doing it for, to, for us to be on the Americana Network. Well, the marketing people are talking to the, the As the World Turns people, and they said, well, don't worry about a thing. You can use any of our people, and you, and, and you don't have to pay them. And the As the World Turns people said, oh, no, 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 no. We're union. So I got paid, I had one line. The Homestead Pickers played one verse and one chorus of the Calico Cat about 20 times. And we got paid union scale. I did about 20 minutes worth of work with my one line. Got almost 350 bucks. Just poof. And I had a little money from somewhere else, you know, one other little gig I did. I said, shoot, that's enough for five hours of studio time. Woo! You know, and here I went. And I didn't know what I was going to record, and all of a sudden it came to me. I'm going to record those little things that I've been telling people about the old timers here at Silver Dollar City. And I didn't know what to call it. But I was, I was beside myself. As long as I've been making little recordings on tapes, I have had to pay extra to make them a little bit longer because in 15 minutes on the side, I don't even work up a good head of steam. And you make them longer, they're more expensive. You make a CD, you've got 80 minutes, whether you use it or not. I'm like a kid in a candy store. So, people have been asking me for years, they're wanting that story about the lady that owned the cabin, the old nasty log cabin down the hill that you can't get into. I can't tell about it anymore because I can't get people in it. But they've been telling these stories about the old timers here. And I thought, that's what I'll do. And all of a sudden, everything went, ching, fit right in together, and I went in and recorded that thing. It's done. I sold it all through October. Mailed him one at his request. One of the most fantastic people to ever come here to Silver Dollar City was here opening day, May the 1st, 1960. His name was Lloyd Heller. He was born in Pennsylvania, in Pennsylvania Dutch country. And he knew from a very early age that he was going to be a performer. 
I've seen pictures of him in high school plays. He always played the character role because he could actually act. Well, he did a little bit of everything. He sold a few used cars and sold a little real estate, but in between, he was always looking for acting jobs. Whenever he could find it, he had a family, he had to feed. And acting jobs, it's tough to make them pay enough to feed the family, but, but oh Lloyd, he managed it. He even worked for Ringling Brothers for a period of time. And when he got there, he had already taken the job when he found out. Unlike what he had always perceived, at the bottom of the pecking order in the circus are the clowns. And he was a clown. Now at the top of the pecking order, you got the aerialists, the trapeze artists and the tightrope walkers. And down at the bottom, nobody has any respect for the clowns. I mean, the people love the clowns, but that's not all they get paid. Well, just trying to select what stories I was going to tell about, about him, I didn't know what to do. But in 1960, he came here. He'd been down in uh, du Dumas, Texas, doing summer stop with a young feller. And he said to him, he said, young feller, you're good. Come go with me. I found a place where we can get us a job acting and we don't have to go nowhere. Let's go to Branson. And the kid said, Branson? I just got out of Branson. It was Gary Clarkson who followed Shad here. And when they started, they, got, they hadn't named him that yet. When he started out, they said, we need a blacksmith. You know how? And he said, no, but I learned. And he promptly changed his name to a name more appropriate for a blacksmith, Shad. Of course, based on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego of the fiery furnace, that seemed very appropriate. Well, he came here and he started learning how to blacksmith, and there's so many stories to tell about that man, I have to just pick and choose. I don't think I even recorded this one, but this is a great story. Shad was learning. He was not much of a blacksmith yet. He was a performer. He was a showman. He knew how to play a crowd better than anybody they'd ever seen. So one day a guy walked up to him and he said, I understand that you say you can take the roughest kind of steel and harden it and make it into the finest kind of steel. And Shad said, yes, sir. And the man reached in his pipe pocket and whooped out a piece of rebar. The nastiest, dirtiest kind of steel there is. And he pulled up this piece of rebar and he took it and he threw it to Shad and Shad caught it out of the air and he said, can you make me a chisel out of that? And Shad said, 3.30, it'll be done. And he went to work. He was heating and quenching and pounding and folding, trying to get the impurities out of that awful steel. And he, sh oh, he just worked and he worked, skipped lunch. Word made around the park. Of course, the park went much bigger than just this right here <laughs> with Shad's blacksmiths on that shop on that corner over yonder. Oh, he worked and he worked and he worked and he finally got the thing and it was cool and it was ready to go and 3.30 was coming and there was a huge crowd because word had gone around the park like wildfire. He's making a chisel out of a piece of, out of, a piece of rebar. Well, huge crowd and all of a sudden here come that feller that had challenged Shad. Had his hands stuffed in his pocket, his hat on the back of his head kind of come, come strutting up and he looked at Shad and he said, you got my chisel ready? And Shad, he pulled that out of his pocket and he throwed it at the man and the man caught it and said, looks pretty good. Does it work? And he threw it back and Shad caught it out of the air and he said, tell you what, let's find out. What do you say? And he set that chisel on the corner of that big old anvil, picked up a four pound hammer, went bam, and a huge piece of that anvil flew off, sparks shooting through the air, and the crowd went wild. And Shad looked at it and said, seems to work pretty good, and he threw it back to the man, and the man caught it, and Shad said, no charge. Man, I'm telling you, people talked about that for years. 
That's how I heard the story. Pieced it together. Oh, this is one of my favorite Shad stories. What I had to do was select the stories that people would like the most. Shad himself told me this one. They were off on a dog and pony show. Now that was a, 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 a term that was invented by our publicity man here at Silver Dollar City. It's an old uh, vaudeville term. That means take the trained dog, put it in the wagon, hitch up the pony, and take that show on the road. Early on, when Silver Dollar City was brand new, we had to teach people what we had, fall festival. What the heck is that? So we would go around with craftsmen and entertainers and the vivid people. And he would take them to radio shows and television spots and all that kind of thing. Well, I'm telling you, a lot of them hillbillies back then, a lot of first happened on them dog and pony shows. First trip away from home, first plane ride. Well, he said we were going into Chicago. This was a lot of years ago. And they were sitting on the little company plane. And Violet Hensley, the fiddle whittler, was sitting right next to him. And as they're coming down, they're coming down. And of course, it's pretty, you know, patchwork, but it gets dull. And she was looking out the window every now and then, but all of a sudden, they started coming in, uh, making the approach to land in Chicago. And Violet looked out the window and went, because there were just thousands of houses flying by under. And she looked a little perturbed, and she sat up and kind of looked around and then looked again. Kind of looked around and smiled at Chad. He could tell she was getting nervous. Oh, this is making her nervous. And she looked again, and the housetops are getting me even closer. And there are thousands of them coming into the airport. Shad said he leaned over and he said, Do you know what that is down there, darling? She said, No. He said, That's Chicago. She looked one last time and there was houses all the way to the horizon. And she said, Is it bigger than Springfield? I love that story. <laughs> but this this my absolute favorite story. Yep, you're running off on the best one. I'm sorry. Shad back in, now he didn't tell me this story, but he told it to the master glass blower down the hill. He told it to me. There's one that I like even better than this, but I finally figured out it's a theater story. If you wasn't raised in the theater, it ain't this funny. <laughs> it's a good story, but it ain't as funny. This one, everybody likes. It was the Depression. Chad was a fairly young man, didn't have a lot of stuff going on for him, so he found a job, the only job he could find, working as the front man. Hey, you're going to get a real, a real basis in vaudeville here. The front man for an act goes out two weeks ahead of a performance in a certain place, and he puts up the posters in the town where the act is going to be, and at the time, he was working for a barnstorming pilot, one of them with the little the little biplanes that would go from county fair to county fair. Well, they'd hit the big time. He'd been out to put up the posters, came back, and it was the first week in October, and it was a gorgeous day. Beautiful blue sky and a bowl over them, and they were at the Pennsylvania State Fair. And he said, just at the edge of the grounds, there was a field that stretched away from beyond the beyond the, the fence of the state fair. And he said, just green carpet of grass, and that was where the pilot was going to land. He said he'd been around and he'd put up all of them uh, all of them posters that said, plane rides, Pennsylvania State Fair, October to something or other, fifty cents. That's a lot of money during the middle of the Depression. And uh, Shad said there, oh, there was people there. They'd had enough time, and they were all standing there, had their 50 cents in their hands. And he said, uh, my job was to get the people excited so they felt like they got their money's worth. So he said, I'm standing there, and we're waiting. He said, not to worry, folks. He'll be here in just a few minutes. He said, it's pretty spectacular. 
All of a sudden, he said, I heard that plane coming in. I knew they didn't hear it because nobody knew what a plane even sounded like. And he said, I waited until it was about to come over the trees. And he said, I hear him. <gasps> Look! And the plane came over those green trees against that blue sky. And that plane was canary yellow. It was one of those that they stretch the fabric around it and they starch it and paint it good to make it rigid. Very, very light plane. And people went, <gasps> because he had set it up just perfectly. And he had the, and the plane came in and flew around their heads and he said, well, watch him, folks. Look, he's, he's duck, ducking the wings at you. That's him saying hello. You cheer back for him. Hooray! You know, and the plane came in and went <laughs> and he took the first person in line took the 50 cents, escorted them over put them in the front hole of that little biplane strapped them in good he said hang on tight and have fun and the plane taxied around <laughs> made a big circle around the fairground <laughs> came back in and went <laughs> That's what you got for 50 cents. It was almost too exciting for some of them folks. Well, about fifth or sixth back in the line, he said, I noticed there was this little kid. It was a boy about 10 or 11 years old, and he had his baby sister with him, who was probably nine. He said, both of them kids standing there holding their 50 cents. Where them kids got 50 cents, I do not know, but there they were. And while somebody was taking their flight, he walked back there and he said, Say, boy, he said, you know, you and your sister is little. He said, if you would, if it'd be all right with you, it'd be fine with us. We'll put both of you in that seat and strap you both in, and I'll only charge you for one of you to ride. And the boy stuck his 50 cents back in his pocket and said, you got a deal, mister, and made baby sister give her 50 cents to the man. Well, finally the kids turned, uh, came and he escorted them over and boosted them up and put them in that seat. Oh, they fit just fine. And he belted them in there and he said, hang on tight, kids. This is going to be fun. And the plane took off and went... <laughs> <laughs> and down came the plane, crash into a stand of timber about a quarter, half a mile away. Oh man, everybody there went, ah, and started running. Oh, they're just, they're going to the plane wreck. Something new happening at the, at the county fair, at the state fair. Shad's going, oh my God, I gotta get there first. What? Oh, and he looked over, and there was a guy with one of them newfangled motorcycles. And he ran over and he said, I'll bring it right back. And he jumped on and went, and then he ran. Everybody else is running. Shad's going down there and he screeches into the stand of timber, and there's the plane standing on its nose in a brush pile and part of the wings over there and the propellers over there and the pilot's out. He's kind of staggering around. Got a little blood coming down off his forehead, but Shad hollered, are you all right? And the guy said, yeah, yeah, I think I'm okay. He said, but, but where's the kids? And the pilot said, oh my God, the kids. And they ran over and looked at the plane, no kids. Oh, they're running around. The people are running. They're coming. They're getting closer and closer. He's going, think, think. Where could the kids get? Wait a minute. Those kids are little. So he ran over there and down inside, he saw something he hadn't seen before. The seat belt still fastened. And he looked down in that hole where there's a one by 12 where you brace your feet. And he said, kids, are you in here? Four little hands came up over the board. Four scared little eyes looked up at him. And he said, kids, are you all right? And the little boy said, is that all there is to this dadgum ride? And Chad agreed that yes, he hadn't gotten his money worth, money's worth, so he refunded their 50 cents. And the kids went home happy. 
I'm a telling you what. Whew. What an amazing character he was. You want to hear the, the theater story? Yeah. Do you want to hear the theater story? It's a dandy, and I just love it. Yeah, come sit in that rocking chair, ma'am. Yeah, it look, you look like you, you, your rear end is about to move out on this right. thing on them rocks. Ma'am, I got another in here, and I promise you that fella don't fight. <laughs> no, huh? He does. Oh. I'll, walk, I'll walk him for you. Now, once again, Shad looking for something to do. He was in a touring vaudeville show. Now, a vaudeville show is a, a variety show. They do a little bit of everything. So they were touring. 